<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, session that is a live broadcast and uh, which have the um, title OSU 16162, Clinical Studies of a Candidate Drug Capable of Alleviating Dysregulation of the Dopaminergic System. Uh, you, this is a very interactive session, meaning that you will be uh, able to pose questions to the presenter, Arvid Carlson, um, uh, during the session, and for that purpose you shall use the question and answer button that you will find. It's a green one, and you can find it at the lower left of the uh, presentation window. And we will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of this presentation. If you should have any problems hearing or seeing this presentation, you should um, could also use the question and answer button to, to uh, send in your complaints, and you could also use the um, support button that you will find on the top right of your presentation. So there are two possibilities if there are any problems um, during this, this uh, uh, event uh, with hearing or, or, or seeing. Um, it's my uh, great uh, privilege to be the moderator uh, and also discussant of this uh, session. My name is Elias Eriksson. I'm pharmacologist from Gothenburg University. And uh, it's an honor to, to uh, have the opportunity to introduce today's speaker, who is um, a, a very prominent person in psychopharmacology uh, since already since the late 50s, in fact, uh, Professor Arvid Karlsson, uh, also from Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, Arvid Karlsson um, was uh, one of the first who suggested that there is uh, neurochemical transmission in the brain and that the amines uh, may serve as transmitters in the brain uh, when uh, most uh, uh, important uh, players in the field regarded this as very unlikely, so, so, uh, but Arvid uh, subsequently turned out to be right. He also was the first to suggest that dopamine is not merely a precursor to noradrenaline, but a transmitter in its own sense, uh, which also uh, was controversial at first, but now, of course, widely recognized. Uh, Arvid was also the first to show that dopamine is important for the regulation of Locomotion, which of course paved the way, paved the way, way to, to the treatment of uh, Parkinson's disease with dope and other dopaminergic drugs. In 1963, Arvid Carlson and co-workers first suggested that um, antipsychotic drugs act by blocking catecholamine receptors, including dopamine receptors, which of course was the starting point for the dopamine theory of schizophrenia. Um, uh, later on, Arvid was also the first to suggest that partial D2 agonists could perhaps be a, uh, 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 have certain advantages in the treatment of schizophrenia, which also have, have shown to be true uh, uh, by, by, by means of, of the uh, aripiprazole, aripiprazole uh, introduction. Uh, Arvid has also been active in other fields, for example in the serotonin field. In fact, the first selective serotonin replicate inhibitor uh, was uh, uh, invented by Carlson and co-workers here in Gothenburg, the forerunner of, of, of Prozac. Mm, so it's really a, a pioneer in the field that we will have the privilege to listen to today. And, um, Arvid uh, uh, is still very active in research and he is now uh, developing, in the midst of developing a new, very exciting drug uh, belonging to a new class of drug, uh, uh, often called dopamine stabilizers. And uh, I will now turn to you, Arvid and ask you to um, uh, start this session by, by just uh, briefly uh, uh, introduc a brief introduction. Uh, what, what is the dopamine stabil stabil stabilizing uh, drug and, and uh, why would this be important? Thank you, Elias. First of all, thank you for your very kind introduction. Elias will help me through this talk to, to uh, make you understand that the molecule that you see here, it's called minus OSU 6162, that this is a very interesting molecule with some remarkable properties, and as Elias already indicated, acts as a stabilizer of the dopaminergic system, which is its main action. It has some additional actions, but the, what we will focus on to start with is its effect on, on the dopamine system. And first of all, how come that we have been so interested in developing this kind of drug? Well, we, what we wanted to do was to get, get 
beyond the simplistic characterization of brain disorders in terms of either hyper or hypo locomotion of neurotransmitters. So we can just go on here and uh, and, uh, and why is such a concept simplistic? Well, it erroneously assumes that the dysfunction of a neurotransmitter is consistent. That is, the same in different neural circuits or at different times. And there are good examples that this is indeed not so. And we can see that here. There are good, very good, but the two very classical examples that, that I want to bring up here is first Parkinson's disease. Here you have a, a degeneration of dopaminergic pathways and, uh, uh, and that leads to, of course, problems with motor functions. But at the same time, at least in the early stages of Parkinson's disease, this is what you have. I mean, the mental functions are, could be intact for a very long time. So that's one, one example where the dopaminergic system is okay in one respect, but certainly not okay in another. And similarly in schizophrenia, psychotic symptoms are due to hyperfunction of dopamine in some pathways, but then you have other dopaminergic pathways that, that are controlling motor functions, for example, and they may, may be intact. So what it means is, as we can go on here, we can see that if you have such an inconsistency, if whatever drug you pick up that is a full-blown one, in other words, it, it acts on a given transmitter without any limitation, it will have adverse effects because even if you correct one pathway, the dopamine function in one pathway, uh, that is not in all good order, if there are several others, perhaps the majority of the, dopam of the pathways where dopamine is involved, are okay. So if now you start with just either elevating or bringing down the function throughout the whole brain, you are bound to have all kinds of, of, uh, of side effects. And examples of these are, for example, you have the neuroleptics, on the negative side of dopamine function, and, and, and you, you have uh, amphetamine acting upwards, and there are many others that will have such, uh, uh, unhe inevitably will have considerable uh, side effects, serious side effects, actually. Um, if I may interrupt you there with a question, you, you um, received the Nobel Prize in the year 2004 mainly for your discoveries in Parkinson's disease. You have obviously d spent a lot of time with that disorder and also you were the first to suggest the hyperactivity of dopamine in schizophrenia. Have you for long been thinking along these lines that it must be a, 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 a difficulty in, in shutting down or overstimulating the system? Mm, I have to confess I was like the, uh, all the others to start <laughs> with. It, it, we, it, it was a wonderful idea that maybe the, the whole system could act in the, all over the brain. And dopamine, if dopamine is high in one place, it's going to be high everywhere and so forth. So, uh, but uh, of course, this, the side effects, they became so obvious. And the more specific drugs you develop, the more problems you got. So that really showed that there is something fundamentally wrong in this simplistic idea. I heard you give a lecture at the CMP Congress in Stockholm a few years ago, and I know that you expressed some concern about the reports that antipsychotic drugs may in fact uh, reduce the size of the brain. Would you like to uh, yes. comment on that? Well, that's an important uh, aspect. It deals with the, the effect that uh, many uh, neurotransmitters have on, on the plasticity of the brain, the ability of, of the brain to rebuild itself at the microscopic level and even at the macroscopic level in order to adjust to whatever new uh, 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 problems will come up due in the course of a human being's life. So 
the, one has to to bring in that, and that there are some. These, these problems are very difficult to, to study in a very controlled way in humans, but there are some very interesting uh, studies in macaques, in monkeys, uh, and I think of of those that were have been done in in Pittsburgh and some other places in Denmark, for that matter, uh, and where it can be seen that if you treat with uh, uh, neuroleptic drugs over a fairly short time, a couple of years only, and then you, you examine the brains of, of these ma- macaques, they are no longer normal. They have changes, and the interesting thing, for example, is that certain cortical areas are reduced in volume, and the interesting thing is that those, that kind of, of changes that you see all the, cha- the changes that you can see in cro- chronic schizophrenics. The same as... Uh, yes. So the problem, is it a disorder yeah. or is it a drugs? Yeah. A very serious problem, very hard to, to solve this problem. It is. But you wouldn't, uh, you would regard it as a possibility that a uh, too drastic reduction of transmission might have such effect that you wouldn't rule we out cannot that possibility? We cannot exclude it. Yeah. It's something we must keep in mind. Okay. Okay, now, as I assume, you believe that uh, your new drug may, to some extent, uh, solve this problem, or at least, uh, yes. at least uh, approach it's, it. It's a new, it's a new concept. That uh, suppose you can find a drug that can act at the same time, both upwards and downwards, in terms of, for example, dopamine function. And thus, thus to be able to correct at the same time what is too much and it what is not enough, then it would be that would be a stabilizer. It would be a drug with stabilizing properties, and that it may seem like a miracle, but the drug we are going to talk about now is such a drug, in my in my opinion. So, what do we see here? First of all, this is a model that now in retrospect, we have been working with this for a long time, but now in retrospect, I think one can, I I think about a a kind of fatigue model, a way of of, uh, restoring mental fatigue, but we are talking, we are talking about animals now, in this case, rats, and what 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 is seen here is that you take a rat, you take it out, the poor rat out, uh, out of a, a re- relatively pleasant home cage, put it in a small, very unpleasant place, uh, and 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 where it wants, very uh, of course wants to get out, and to get back home, and uh, and 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 it explores all possibilities of getting away and, and this, uh, but the exploration uh, exploratory activity goes down and down so what you can see on the column on on on, on the on the left side here uh, that is what the animal finally arrives at giving up doing absolutely nothing and then if now if you treat the animal with increasing doses, as you can see here, of our drug, you can see now it goes, it gets up again and starts once again to explore, to 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 to, to, to find out. Even after all, there is a possibility to get away from this. And actually, the increase that you see here, uh, in retrospect, now with all the the uh, experience that we have. This is actually a curve. So it goes up to a maximum at the 50, as you can see here, and then it goes down again. So it is a curve. We never, in, in the beginning, we didn't uh, dare to, to draw it like a curve, but with a maximum at 50 micromoles per gram at this, per kilogram at this time. But, uh, but that is actually what we think today. So that is what is happening in a, an animal that is so-called habituated. 
before we go further, <clears throat> just for those not famili familiar in this field, could we say that what you see in the first part of this curve would be what you expect from a dopamine stimulating drug like amphetamine or a dopamine agonist? Would you agree with that? Oh, sure. If you have a, an agonist, uh, it can do that. The problem with the agonist is that if you, when you increase the dose, it goes up and up, and then it ends up in a, in a terrible way with stereo stereotype behavior and all kinds of problems. But with this, with this kind of drug, it goes up to a certain point, which is a rather moderate uh, degree of activity, certainly no hyperactivity. And, but, but, uh, and, and if you go beyond that, it starts to go down again, yeah. but not very dramatic. Very interesting. We we'll now have another picture. Please. Yes, this, this is one curve where, where actually statistically it can be shown that we are indeed dealing with a curve with, uh, with, with, with low doses of the drug, upgoing activity, with, with this motor activity all the time that we are measuring here. Of, of, uh, or in the previous slide it happened to be a rat, but this time it is, is mice that we are looking at. So if we go up to a, a, uh, a level here, this is in milligram per kilo in this case, um, uh, to, where you, to the, the level where you have the, the star above, you have a significant increase with dosage. If you go beyond it, in, in, uh, to, towards the right from the point indicated by the star, it goes down again, so it's a biphasic curve. And that is exactly what it should be in theory. And, and uh, uh, because uh, we are, the, this is what something I'm, I'm aiming at later on. We will understand that you have, you have one, one force that is working in upper direction and another word, and, uh, in another in downward direction. And in these particular mice, you have a level, an intermediate kind of level on motor activity, so you can pick up so nicely this biphasic curve. Very elegant. Now we have rodents with another degree of activity. Yes. These are, now we are back to rats again, by the way. And, and they are now brought f from their home cage, all right, but now they are brought into a, an area with lots of... Uh, of interesting new objects that have must be investigated carefully. So they are up in a very high activity. And if now you, you give increasing doses, you start, you start at the, at, you have the, the controls at the far left, and then you give increasing doses of uh, one and the same drug all the time, our fabulous drug, and then it's going downwards. So, and, and in this case, it, 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 what is needed here is somewhat higher doses than those that, are, that were needed in the beginning in those inactive animals to, to activate them. So, but, but finally, you, you will get this inhibitory effect. And that is what is the only thing that shows up here in this picture. So then we have perhaps a, a feature of a antipsychotic drug, for example, an anti-dopamine drug. And what about other well-known effects of these drugs that are anti-dopamine? For example, catalepsia is a well-known phenomenon for almost all antipsychotic drugs, D2 blocking, with the exception of clozapine. Uh, do you get that with high doses of this drug? Now that is, of course, a, a remarkable aspect of the whole thing, that you can go down you do get down to a very low activity, but when you test for catalepsy, there is, it's not, hasn't been possible yet to, to see any sign, any, any sign of catalepsy. And just to uh, go one step further from here to humans, you don't see with, with this drug any extrapyramidal side effects. Mm -hmm. As you know, catalepsy predict, predicts extrapyramidal side effects. So mm -hmm. this drug can, doesn't do that, not in, in doses that can be tolerated by human mm -hmm. beings. Fascinating. 
um, another, this, since this is a reduction in, in spontaneous locomotion in active animals, one might wonder what would happen if you give a uh, stimulating drug such as amphetamine. Most neuroleptics can block the hyperactivity of amphetamine. Do you get an increase or a reduction in amphetamine-used locomotion by, by your compound? I haven't put in a slide on this. We have lots of evidence with several uh, central stimulants and they all show the same thing. They all show this kind of picture. With increasing doses, you get a decrease. The only difference that um, we have seen is that we can, if we are very careful with dosage and timing and so on, we can pick up uh, at the low dose of this drug and at, at, at a short time a slight elevation. In, so, you have a stimulation of the central stimulant, and when you give this drug, you can see mm -hmm. during a very short time, uh, after, uh, or if the dose is small enough, mm -hmm. you can see a certain, yeah, yeah. certain increase, but then it goes down. Yeah. So we have, uh, even here, we have a biphasic curve. It's only that, that the rising part of it is so very small that you can hardly pick it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 discussing other situations where you have may have elevation of dopamine in the brain. You are, we are talking about very active rats and amphetamine-treated rats and so on. Uh, I read a paper uh, by Stensland and you co-authored ab about uh, uh, ethanol-consuming rodents and the effect of this drug. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, uh, we can replicate uh uh, what, I, what we have been talking about now, about, for example, this with the central stimulants, that, uh, as Pia Stensland so, so nicely has demonstrated, that uh, you, uh, if, you, if, you have, if you have animals that are uh, being uh, used to, to, for alcohol intake, and... Um, which they cannot, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are abusing the drug, and poor animals. If you treat them with this drug, you, they can get away from, from mm. this problem. <laughs> Obviously, this opens up for various uh, different clinical applications of this drug, but we will come back to that later. First, the last question on this slide, I, I would just like to, which I think many dopamine researchers would, would like to ask you, d d does it display affinity for the D2 receptor in vitro and vivo? Is it, a, is it an agonist, an antagonist, a partial agonist? What is it? Yes, that's, uh, it, it, it binds, uh, it, and I will show you actually human data to demonstrate that it can display, uh, the in pet studies, you can displace actually with this drug uh, uh, radioactive raclopride from its binding sites. So we have very strong, we, ha we have such animal data as well, but it, it's especially important that we have very good human data that we will come back to later on. So it, this is a drug that binds to dopamine D2 receptors. There is no question about that. And do you see in vitro uh, any signs of partial agonism of this drug? Yes. The, it, uh, it, uh, it shows uh, some intrinsic activity. But the interesting thing is that when we move from in vitro to in vivo and look very careful to, to, to carefully to, to see if we can pick up any intrinsic activity. Nobody, we, nobody has been able to see that. And we have tried really very hard, especially with pro prolactin studies, but the only thing we can see is evidence of antagonism on the D2 receptors. <clears throat> so mostly when people hear about dopamine stabilization, they might think of partial agonists such as Abilify, but this is, you can definitely rule out that as the possibility, that's the, the, the mechanism underlying this effect. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, if we try partial agonists on the models, especially this, the, the fatigue model, that the animal fatigue model that I showed a little while ago, uh, it doesn't work. Hmm. Partial agonists are unable to uh, to uh, stimulate these fatigue, these uh, 
habituated animals mm. to get up and do another try to explore the, the boring cage. It's impossible. It's only this kind of drug that mm. can do that. And of course, you can do it with full-blown agonists, but that is, we, yeah. as we have already said, not a good solution. Absolutely. Uh, now I think everyone is intrigued to hear you explain how this all m might come about. And uh, uh, here's a, a nice slide. Please yes. uh, show us. This is a slide where we need a little bit of pointer here. Because what you see, you see these oblique uh, thing, uh, which is a, ner is a dopaminergic nerve terminal going all the way through. Uh, the picture. This is, an, by the way, of course, an, an electromicroscopic picture. Uh, I have gotten the, uh, it from Susan Sisak of Pitt, Pittsburgh. I like this picture very much. It's extremely informative. So if you, if you have this, you, you now see this nerve terminal with its bead, uh, bead-like uh, extension here. And if we go Let's go first to the synapse. It, this is in deep red, the synapse, and and on um, and it's a dopaminergic synapse. On the postsynaptic side of the synaptic cleft, you have a thick membrane, cell membrane, and in those thick cell membranes, there are receptors. Dopaminergic receptors are green here. And so they are the ones that are, the, and they are, of course, adapted to respond to very high levels of, of dopamine. If we, and they have been marked with a yellow number one, as you can see there. And if we move a little bit upwards from there, you, you again, say, again see this is the same green symbol of the synapse, the label as two here, but now you can see that, of course, here the dopamine uh, uh, level in the, in, in the extracellular space is not, is not deep red anymore. It's much lower. It's getting blue, bluer and bluer. That's lower and lower. And you can go even further to number three uh, on this, that one, this very much lower. So these these are now re uh, receptors that are located outside, uh, that are targets for the dopaminergic uh, uh, nerve terminals. But if we go back to the dopamine uh, nerve terminal again, we will see that they also have the same symbols, that is D2 receptors, green, and, and they are uh, not in the synaptic cleft, but outside. So they are adapted to much lower concentrations of dopamine. And what we, what we have found is that these receptors that are located on the dopaminergic neuron itself, we call them outer receptors. And outer receptors uh, the purpose of these outer receptors is that if, if the concentration of dopamine in the, in the extracellular space tends to get too high, they will uh, respond to the increase in dopamine uh, level and they will turn off all kinds of activities of the dopaminergic neurons. And of course, uh, um, if you have a blocking agent, it will do uh, acting on the D2 receptor. They will do the opposite. So these are the autoreceptors, and they are very important for the understanding of our drug because they are the ones that, in our opinion, and we have evidence for that, will be the first one to, the, to respond. So that means that with already with low doses of our drug, they will... It will block these receptors, and, and that will lead to an elevation of dopaminergic function. And what we are looking at here is, is the axon of the dopaminergic neuron. But we have, of course, also um, similar receptors in the cell bodies and in the dendrites, not shown here. But so they are also outer receptors. And, and their function is to 
to turn off the the dopaminergic activity uh, uh, if if the, the, if there is a tendency for this activity to get too high in the extracellular space. But the 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 other the, those receptors where you have all these uh, uh, arrows at the uh, at the postsynaptic uh, side here, we call them heteroreceptors. So we have it's a very important distinction between autoreceptors and mm-hmm. heteroreceptors because from a fun- functional point of view they are operating antagonistically to each other. So you, you with heteroreceptor you refer to any receptor that is not an autoreceptor? Absolutely. Okay. Because yes. some people use the word in other meanings, but I understand. In fact, I think you coined the term autoreceptor once, didn't you? Yes, uh, <laughs> I, uh, yes I have to <laughs> plead guilty. Yes. <laughs> and it's still usable, yeah. So where does uh, US, OSU come in here? OSU will, OSU 6162, when you start with very low doses, those receptors that are uh, on the autoreceptors and also those uh, receptors that are heteroreceptors but are far away from the synaptic cleft, they will be the ones who will respond first. And, 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 and so, and what we, the outcome of that will be, the, it will be the, the effect of the autorecept, on the autoreceptors that will dominate. So therefore, the dopaminergic activity will go up and the animal will move more and be, became more wakeful and so forth. But when you increase the dose of, of, um, of our drug, it will start more and more to uh, to uh, stimulate the heteroreceptors, which operate in the opposite direction. So that, therefore, you can understand. You said stimulate, you mean block the heteroreceptors. Yeah, that's the kind of uh, yeah. of problem I have. I <laughs> sometimes <laughs> say the opposite of what, block but that yeah. that's your <laughs> you play a very important role here <laughs> in in correcting me when I say it's so. Always blocking receptors, never activating it. Is it so? You would you get to explain to our readers? It's a o, it's OSU sixty one sixty two. In vivo will be a, a blocking agent all the time. Blocking all the time. Okay, thank you. So, when you are when you are blocking the heteroreceptors, then the activity of the animal and, and the wakefulness and so forth will come down. Okay. And what about will it uh, subsequently affect these? Uh, receptors in the in the uh, in the synaptic region where the concentrations are high the the the, the postsynaptic receptors uh, normally exposed to high concentrations we would like to have a better evidence but what what we we are, i am i am personally convinced this is the site where uh, these receptors that are sitting in this thick postsynaptic membrane for some reason, uh, our molecule cannot uh, bind enough to that <clears> one, <throat> not enough to cause catalepsy or extrapodaminous. So that is the lovely aspect of it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think we have some data here, so, or some, some summarizing yes. sentences. So this is just to, to repeat uh, what uh, the picture uh, to, uh, told, uh, what, on, what I told you on the basis of the picture. So first of all, if you, if you look at in vivo conditions, our drug will be a blocking agent altogether, nothing else. And when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the receptors in different sites, it will be autoreceptors that will, uh, will, will be hit, will respond at the lowest level. So that's why you will start out with an activating effect of the drug. But as you increase the dose, then more and more heteroreceptors will be, be recruited, they will be bound, it will, be, will, will be blocked. And therefore, the increase that you have at low doses in activity, wakefulness, and so forth, 
will, will go, start to go down again. So that's why you have this biphasic curve. If you, if you look at the, uh, if the, the entire extrasynaptic population of heteroreceptors and, and compare with the synaptic heteroreceptors, you will find, as I said, and this is something I would like to have better evidence for, but I am convinced that the synaptic heteroreceptors, they can hardly be hit. By, by, this, uh, by this drug. So it's only the extrasynaptic heteroreceptors that are involved mm -hmm. in, in the profile of, of this drug. If you have this preferential, you have this preferential blockade of autoreceptors, then you should see an increase in extracellular dopamine levels with, the, for example, in vivo microdialysis. Do you see that after with you? Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. A very good data in okay. favor of that. Oh, yes. Okay. So you mentioned the D1 here. Yeah, D1. I think D1 plays a key role for the, the profile, pharmacological profile of this drug. And that is because if you, if you have doses of the drug that will block the autoreceptors, that will lead to an activation of the dopaminergic system, dopaminergic neurons, and, and, and there are some pathways of dopaminergic, some dopaminergic pathways that target, that where the target neuron is equipped with only D1 receptors. And therefore, since the drug does not bind or do anything directly to the D1 receptors, what you will have if you, when you block the autoreceptors, you will have a stimulation, an indirect stimulation of the D1. And I think this effect on, on the D1 receptors is probably a, of enormous importance for the profile of the drug. And that is, one of, that is actually where the, the um, partial agonists are not doing so well because mm -hmm. With a partial agonist, you will also, with those low doses, they will bind to the autoreceptors and thereby reducing the activity of the dopaminergic neuron, and that will lead to a reduction mm. of D1. Of so that's, 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 I think, the reason why the, the, the partial agonists, they are, use, they are useless in our uh, fatigue model. And it's quite a big difference in terms of synaptic function, of course, if you have, it's, it's quite the opposite. Oh, absolutely. So the, uh, the balance between D1 and D2, I think, is very important. And here we have one of the keys to the, 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 the mode of action of this drug. Everyone is talking about the prefrontal cortex when it comes to D1. Is it the prefrontal cortex you are referring to here? Yes, certainly. It's important, but I think that the... The, the, the highest density of D1 receptors that you have in the brain are in the basal ganglia. Uh, and they are involved in, in a, a connection here between the striatum and the thalamus. And, uh, and the D, here the D1 is stimulating uh, on this direct pathway so that the D1, the stimulation of D1 will lead to an activation of uh, the whole flow of activity passing through the thalamus, so uh, leading up to the cortex. So I think, even though the, the cortex, I'm sure it's important, but I am even more impressed by the striatal okay, direct good. pathway. Interesting. So what do you want to show with this slide? Yes, I have already referred to this. This is the PET study that has been done in, at the University of Amsterdam where uh, healthy volunteers were given single doses of OSU 6162 and, uh, and they were gi they given uh, the uh, radioactive rectal pride as it is a indicator here so what we are see what the curve shows here is the degree the percentage of displacement of the radioactive bracteloprid 
by OSU 61-62. But, uh, and you see it's a curve that goes up to, uh, it goes quickly up to about 20% and already at a low plasma uh, level uh, of OSU of uh, 0.2, just about 0.2 micrograms per liter, micro uh, moles per liter, I'm sorry. Um, and this rapid rise that you are, have up to from 0 to 0.2, I think it has a very interesting uh, mechanism because if you consider the population of uh, autoreceptors, it's a very small population, and uh, also the extrasynaptic heteroreceptors are also, um, uh, well, in, in the beginning with low doses, they, they, they cannot, they are probably not enough to explain this degree of displacement. So the, the best uh, explanation that we have today for this rapid increase up to, to 0.2 micromoles uh, per liter is due to an additional effect, and that is that is the effect that blocking autoreceptors lead to. If you block autoreceptors, you stimulate the dopaminergic neuron, and this leads to an increased release of dopamine into the synaptic cleft, and, and this dopamine will then, this elevated extracellular dopamine will then add to the displacement. So this displacement, as we see here, is due to two different things, direct binding by the drug to the receptors and to the increase in dopamine that will add to b displacing uh, uh, the radioactive ligand here. Hmm. That's how we interpret it. Um, obviously, you get a quite a modest blockade here. One is thinking about clozapine, which gets higher, in fact. Wouldn't this be uh, uh, proof enough that this will not cause extrapermidal side effect, you think? Could a drug do that yes. with this modest blockade? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, you can look upon it this way, absolutely. I mean, the, uh, in order to... Uh, to really uh, interfere with, well, I'm, my thinking is always uh, in terms of the synaptic cleft of all course. the time. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Never I like, Never even though you can disregard this idea of the synaptic cleft as an important yeah. f aspect and say, okay, it's just because it's not, it's, it's just this much, or yeah. it's not enough. Okay. All right, <laughs> another way. Okay. I, okay. I have to uh, admit that this can be interpret this way also. But, but, but as I understand you, you mean that this very far from complete detoblicade is not the same far from complete detoblicade you see by clozapine. It's a different mechanism underlying Absolutely. this. Absolutely. So, so, very yeah. different. So oh, this, yes. this is not the clozapine lookalike. It's something no, very different. That's no. what I was driving at. Yeah, and by the way, I, I, we shouldn't disregard the fact that clozapine is not devoid of extra side effects. If you do careful studies, you will you will see them also. That it's, is a controversial statement that it might be. Yeah, some would not agree. Some will agree. Some, some <laughs> will agree with me. Yes. Okay. Uh, so what is this? Well, the, what we have seen so far was the displacement of uh, uh, of radioactive arachlopride. Uh, uh, from its binding sites in the striatum, in the human striatum. It's interesting, and we saw the curve that uh, uh, turned towards uh, the horizontal leveling out. But if we, if we instead we look at pro prolactin, you will see a curve that's going straight up all the time. So it, it, what it shows here is a confirmation that indeed you have blockade of dopaminergic receptors because this is, is uh, I think everybody would agree that this, 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 this increase in, in prolactin is a sign of a dopaminergic Absolutely. D2 antagonism. 
and these are obviously extrasynaptic, so they are well, this is well in line with yes, the concept. They are not, the, the, yes, they are extrasynaptic, and in addition, they are located uh, uh, very close to the bloodstream. They don't have to have a problem of passing the blood brain barrier. So, and actually, that's our, also our experience that uh, with, so far, with prolactin, when we are looking at uh, very low doses in, in humans, that uh, already very low doses will cause an increase in prolactin. But there is another very important thing to add, and that is that within the clinical dose range, you will never get a, a level of prolactin that will cause any problems, like what neuroleptics ah. are doing. So it, <laughs> it, uh, uh, there are only po positive things. It, of course. Everything, everything fits, you know. It's amazing. <laughs> Obviously, this is also an argument that this is not a clozapine, because clozapine would not cause an increase in, in prolactin. In fact, it doesn't. So, so it's also a difference between this drug and clozapine. Uh, that's very true, yeah. Uh, okay, I think we should go forward now to another transmitter. And before we go into the serotonin, the effects of your drug on serotonin. Uh, what is your view? Uh, everyone knows that serotonin is involved in depression and anxiety. You, as I said before, developed the first SSRI. But what is your view today about the role of serotonin, for example, in psychosis? I have uh, had different views about it over the years, but I have become more and more convinced that serotonin is also a player in the uh, uh, mechanism underlying uh, psychosis. And, and a very interesting aspect of serotonin in, in connection with dopamine is that they seem to be a tandem. They, they should be close to each other and spontaneously, if one goes up, the other goes up, they follow each other. And if they don't, there will be problems, imbalances. So therefore, it's good to know that even if we are dealing here in the case of OSU 61, 62, uh, only with partial agonism, it's better than nothing. Okay. So what, what you can see here, this is just an example. We have, we have evidence in vitro as well as in vivo evidence for both an effect of 5-HT, on 5-HT receptors on, on the, in the 5-H2 uh, in the... Uh, 5-H2-1 family and the 5-H2 family, yeah. both of them. But here, we, what we are looking at is only one particular receptor, and that is the 5-H2A receptors, and uh, where we have, we have uh, uh, in vitro evidence of, of uh, the effect and uh, uh, of um, the binding there, and addition, addition, the evidence is that actually, in vitro, uh, you, it's more or less like a full agonist. Mm -hmm. But in vivo, of course, not much less. I mean, as it usually is. But what we see here, so this is a model of 5-HT2 activity. And the gray column that you have with the three stars on top is a test drug that is a classical full agonist. And, uh, and if you give this drug to a, a mouse and, uh, and count the number of head twitches uh, in the, during the first five minutes, you will get this number that you have here, about five, something like. So, so that is what the full agonist in the, is doing in terms of head twitches. If rather than uh, the full agonist you give our drug, you will see that increasing doses will actually induce head twitch because controls have no head twitches where, where, that you have to the far the far left. The, the, you can see that, but that is, that is there, there you have zero. <laughs> and but now if you give increasing doses of of our drug they will indeed cause head twitches, but far away from the, the, the number of head, much less than the number of head twitches that the DUI drug, our full-blown full agonist, is doing. So this would, be, this would be a nice evidence confirming our in vitro data that we have 
indeed a, an agonistic effect, but it or, or on on 5-A2A receptors, but not a full agonist. It looks like a partial agonist. But in order to prove partial agonism, you must also be able to demonstrate antagonism. And and here we have the next slide. Here again, the gra you, first of all, to the far left you have the zero. These are control animals. And the, the gr big gray column here is our full-blown DOI agonist, uh, which is this, this number of a very high level of, of head twitches. If now on top of DUI, you give increasing doses of our drug, now they are inhibitory. Hmm. So that's a classical example of a partial agonist. Okay. So when this drug stabilizes dopamine, it's not by partial agonism. When it stabilizes serotonin, it is classical partial agonism. It two is. Ways. Yeah, that is exactly so. And, and, and as a partial agonist, it's, it's not uh, isn't, it's not doing the fabulous things that, at least on the dopamine system, okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. But uh, it's, it's better than nothing. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, these are just two references, yeah? Yeah, I, because I have, I have talked so much now, and you may not believe me, but I can tell you that uh, there is a lot of, of, uh, of data in the literature and here are two papers where you have uh, both in vitro and in vivo data, lots of them. And then in addition to these papers, you have references to other papers. So the, when uh, I think I can say that um, the evidence uh, underlying my talk here is pretty good. Okay, <laughs> I believe you. Uh, before now, we shall soon have some questions also, but now we would like to see some clinical data. You have really started clinical trials uh, with this drug already, uh, so please um, tell us about it. Yes, uh, you may wonder why we have uh, selected uh, different uh, disorders uh, dopamine is involved everywhere, so how, how did we start? Well, in the beginning, we, we did uh, the obvious things, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, and then we went on from Parkinson's, of course, was not a big step to go to Huntington's disease. And then we, uh, for various reasons, we went to ME, MS, alcohol dependence, and so forth. So... The, the, it's a, uh, it's a, altogether a dozen small studies in the, which are in different stages. But if we go further on and see what we have in terms of double-blind control studies, uh, we have, uh, they are in different stages. Some are uh, uh, five double-blind control studies have been uh, completed, are in different stages of reporting. Two have been published, three are nearly ready for reporting to the uh, Swedish F FDA and uh, for subject, uh, subsequent publications. Four of these studies deal with problems related to fatigue and one with alcohol dependence. All show improvement compared to placebo. And there is then one more control study that is, uh, is not, has been completed but is still under, uh, in analysis. So uh, what I would like to go from here then would, would be to look at the, 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 uh, the, the, fat, the, the studies with fatigue because that is the ones, mental fatigue, these, these are the ones where we have the, the best evidence. And what is mental fatigue? It's a common, often severely dis disabling condition following upon a stroke, brain trauma, or in connection with several other brain disorders. The patient can perform intellectual work for uh, pretty good, but only for a few hours or so and then uh, and then it gets very tired, it cannot go on anymore. And uh, in addition, the, the patient may find it difficult 
to read uh, things such a simple thing as reading a newspaper or take part in a conversation with several people at a time. So it's a very disabling condition. And the kind of studies we have done in mental fatigue have been of the double-blind crossover design. So as you can see here, uh, randomly people, people, the patients get started on placebo or drug. And the dose during four weeks uh, each uh, have been increased starting out with 15 milligrams twice daily and going then to 30 milligrams twice daily and then the, the final two weeks 45 milligrams twice daily. And but what I would like to say already here, this, what we, this is what we did in the first study, but in our subsequent studies we cut down the doses very much because we had these 45 milligrams twice daily is for most people an overdose. What came out of this first study, uh, where we had we ended up with this large with this overdose. Nevertheless, we, 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 they, they were they were twelve uh, twelve patients, and uh, they were uh, uh, half of them were following upon stroke, and the other half. Uh, after brain trauma. And what you see here is the proportion of uh, responders in the sense that uh, the outcome was that in, was in favor of drug compared to placebo. So the, the blue columns here uh, show that the majority of the patients responded in favor of the drug and if you look at the uh, three um, uh, with a star above, uh, or the three f uh, to the far left, uh, you can see that uh, uh, there was only, uh, actually it's only one patient who, who was red and uh, who responded in the opposite direction. And there were, there were three who, who we couldn't decide uh, we couldn't decide whether there was a difference at all. But the inter it's an interesting thing with this particular red fellow who responded in the opposite direction that uh, what happened with him was that he got an overdose. So at the end of the four weeks he felt lousy. But when he it was switched over to placebo, he felt much better. So, and we have tried him, him in, a, in a subsequent open label study, safety study, and we are absolutely convinced he is an excellent responder. But when you say he felt lousy, you don't mean the extra permitted side effects? Uh, of course not, no. What, what they feel when they, they get, one thing, what they feel tired. tired. It's exactly according as to the, the textbook, the yes. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, they do. They have also some uh, unpleasant feelings in their stomach. Uh, okay. Maybe a little bit uh, uh, tending to nausea, not full-blown nausea, but on, in that direction, okay. yes. So, rather than going through the different, uh, each one of the different fatigue studies, I have, what I have put together here is something that I hope will impress you <laughs> as a summary. What happened in these double-blind control studies, all of them, was that it, it was no question about the outcome uh, if you compare those who started with placebo and those who started with active drug. Those who started with placebo showed a very uh, clear response, uh, a favorable response, whereas uh, this response was still there uh, with those who started with active drug, but less, much less impressive. So what I have done here I, uh, is simply to take those patients 
in, in those three, there are three studies, that the, the mental fatigue, number one, that is the one I mentioned to you already, and then there is an extended mental fatigue study with a larger number of um, patients, and in addition, we have Huntington's uh, patients where also fat, the fatigue aspect is being studied. And, and the type of rating has been a little bit different, but not much. I mean, it's a matter of, of fatigue, of improving the fatigue symptoms in all cases. And here I have taken only those patients who started out with placebo. And what you see here in the different columns, you have the plus, and those uh, figures that you have under plus are those who uh, the, where the response was in favor of, uh, of, uh, of the drug in comparison to placebo. Those with zero, you couldn't decide the difference. And those with minus are uh, the ones who responded in the opposite way. <coughs> and if we add up all together, we have, you can see here, uh, all three together, you will see that those who were, is who uh, had a favorable response of, to the drug were, were 20. There were two where we couldn't see that any difference, and then there were three that was in the opposite direction. And if we do statistics now, and, uh, and this now, uh, we, I'm doing a statistic test that I like very much, <laughs> the sign test, because I consider it a foolproof test. So, and if you, if you add up the mental fatigue one, mental fatigue two, and uh, do the sign test on the basis of what you have here, you have a p-value of 0 0.0075. With the mental fatigue two, the extended study, you have a p-value, if that alone, you have a p-value of 0 0.0225. And if we add up all three, we have P, and then you have 0 0.3049. And uh, I, I would like to, to remind you of how clinical studies usually are. You may need hundreds of patients, and, and you will end up with a p-value that if you are happy, lucky, that is below p.05. So... I think, the, uh, at least, yeah, <laughs> uh, I am, at least I am very much impressed by the outcome. Okay, me yes. too. I would just mention to the audience that we have been allowed by the organizers to go on for a few minutes after three o'clock, so we will have time for some questions also, but we have a few more slides before that. Um, uh, uh, this slide is also about fatigue, isn't it? It's the same studies, in fact. Yes, uh, th that, is the, the, that is the mental fatigue, the extended, the mental fatigue too. And what I would like just to bring in here is that uh, all the evidence that we, what we have so far and that I have told you about was without uh, any... Uh, without bringing in the plasma levels of the drug. Um, but if we do that, we will see that you will get ad additional information that will also very strongly support the uh, efficacy of these drugs. So if you have... Sorry. Oops. Here we are. Yes. If, if we have... Uh, now you, you must look at the, uh, the filled-in circles and the top, uh, uh, the, num the A figure here, the top one, and you look at the filled circles. Uh, they are the ones, uh, the patients who started with placebo. And you can see there that there is only one field circle that is below zero, in other words, who got worse, uh, whereas all the rest of the field circles, uh, 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 well, there were two of them who were on zero, but all the rest were above. So, I mean, again, if you use uh, the sign test here, there is no doubt that you have <laughs> with, with this 
the particular uh, score, which is, it's an interesting score, by the way, FAI score, because what it tells you is actually, uh, it answers the questions, what did I do more or less during the period of exposure to the drug and uh, compared to placebo? And, uh, and, and the outcome is that it looks as our data, we have other data in favor of that, that the, what really happens first when the, the patients respond is that they start, without thinking about it, they start to do more. Mm -hmm. It's not just the, the everyday household work and that so forth. It's doing something beyond that. I mean, something that have been, you have, have, have been waiting for you to do, all of a sudden you get started on it. Or you, you get out, you, maybe you do some work in the garden, or you, you go out for, to, uh, to visit somebody uh, to which you uh, couldn't, uh, didn't have the energy to do before. So it's a very, uh, very clear uh, uh, effect. And more, and more so than the MFS scale, which is the more, is the fatigue scale. It's not so striking, but even that one, uh, even that one, if you look at the, the filled uh, circles again, but now, if you only look at those who are or with plasma levels beyond 0.8, then you will find six, six points here, and six, and so six points are, uh, and if, if six, uh, if six patients improve and there is nobody <laughs> doing the opposite, that's statistically significant. <laughs> so even, but at the same time, if you look at the, uh, the trend for the, for if you take now all, all those, uh, th both those who started with placebo and those, those who started with, uh, with active drug, that is, you can see that there is clear tendency, especially in the, in the, in the lowest the graph, uh, the MFS uh, graph, that uh, if you go beyond, if you go beyond 0.8, it looks uh, not impressive at all. Then you actually you have a, 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 a you have less of an outcome. You have a poor outcome actually. So again, if we look at the whole thing, again we are seeing this curve starting out from in far left from zero, then going up, and then going beyond 0.8. It's going down again. So we, we have this bifacy curve that we saw already <laughs> in, the in, in, in the rodents, yes. Fascinating. Yes. Uh, this is a, what next slide? Uh, yeah, please take that first and then I have one more question. Yes, uh, what we uh, now want to do, of course, is to do an extended uh, safety study because all, the, all those studies we have done so far have been not beyond uh, four weeks exposure to drug. Now we go, we are extending this, so now we have one, oh, I'm sorry, there is a, a misprint. It's all, there should be a 180 day safety dose duration, dose titration study in mental fatigue pa patients of different diagnoses. So that is what we are, uh, what's going on now, it is very, it shows very new in, in interesting information for especially that if you go on week after week and the patient has improved perhaps already at the during the first few weeks but then if you go on they they get better and better mm. week after week month after month so so we are what we have been seeing in the four weeks has just been the beginning. I mean, it's even <laughs> even better. So, and uh, and we want to then to ex increase increase the scope to include patients with uh, different disorders, you know, such as ADHD, internees inclined to violence. And that, if we have any time, would be nice if we could talk because that that is where where you have done such interesting work. 
Yeah, we have found a, a, a clear cut anti aggression effect uh, of this drug uh, student, Eric Studer, that where it uh, also again, you have a situation where you probably have more dopamine than usual in the rodents and where you see a very clear cut uh, anti aggressive effect with uh, no effect on locomotion and so on. So that's obviously in line with what you have been claiming here. But let. Yeah, would you say, just yeah. Say, it has been followed up by so the, an application has now been submitted to the, our little Swedish FDA uh, on internees uh, inclined to violence. Mm -hmm. So this will there will be a clinical study. Will hopefully get started within a couple of months. Exciting. Finally, before we have one or two questions from the audience before we finish this, um, uh, I think this. Focus on fatigue is in fact very interesting. It's always nice when, and commendable and fun when a new diagnosis is in focus that has been neglected before. Uh, but but um, there are, as you mentioned here, many other possible conditions and one could of course mention the obvious ones, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, etc. If you should guess what would be the most important indication for this compound of all possible indications? Well, today I uh, what I'm thinking perhaps uh, most uh, on is the, uh, is the aging problem and the, uh, the dementia. Mm. I, feel yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel convinced mm. that uh, with this drug we shall be able, I'm perhaps convinced, almost convinced, with this drug we shall be able to postpone the period of, uh, we will all get demented if we get old enough, but the day when this becomes troublesome will be postponed by several years <laughs> by this drug. I wouldn't have guessed that, but uh, <laughs> interesting, fascinating. Uh, we have gone over time here, but I think we should have a few questions from the audience. We are allowed that by the organizers. and. Um, and uh, I shall see if I have received any questions here, just a second. Here we first have a question, what is the effect of this drug on memory? That is close to what you just said. Yes, the, uh, the, uh, there is a de definitely a, a, an effect on, co on cognitive functions. But uh, it, the, it, that's in the sense, perhaps mostly, of... Uh, of the, uh, fatigue. I mean, if if the patient is well rested in those f f those studies we have done, the cognitive functions seem to be rather good, but they do they get tired. They stop thinking after the intellectual work for any period of time more than an hour or so can be a, quite a problem. But uh, uh, in in the case of of dementia, of Alzheimer, my prediction would be that uh, the cognitive aspects are not the ones that will be uh, uh, where you have the big, best effects. It will be rather on other aspects okay. or emotional aspects and so forth okay. of the dementia, of Alzheimer. Here's one question. I don't know if you can answer to that for various reasons, but someone here is asking what data of the OSU, OSU uh, drug for alcohol or drug abuse did the speaker have so far? Clinical oh, data sure. on, 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 there on, are. on abuse. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. So that is the, 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 the study that has been done at the Karolinska Institute has been completed and is ready, almost ready for... Uh, for reporting and publications, and it's very clear-cut effect. There is a statistically significant effect. This is a two-arm study, 30 plus 30 patients, I think it was, 30 on, on drugs, 30 on placebo, and there was a statistically significant favorable outcome. And uh, incidentally, it was found that uh, those patients who had a high tendency to impulsive behavior, they were the ones who responded. Hmm. Those who, with little impulsivity did res didn't respond. This was what, what the study actually dealt with was the, the uh, uh, seeking, hmm. the drug seeking behavior. Fascinating. Unfortunately, we have got a lot of questions and I think we only have 
time for one more, and that would be, uh, could uh, OSU-6162 reverse the effect of long-term antipsychotic medications? Yes, uh, I think so. Because Oh, yes, because, um, of course, there are some... Uh, some effects that may be, I mean, if you have severe tardive dyskinesia, for example, mm. it, I am not sure if might, that... It might, in fact. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's quite, it, it's not... That could uh, be a I mean, there are, dopamine hyperactivity. Oh, oh, sure, you oh, sure, yes. Yes, I mean, we have, we have this aspect of plasticity. Plasticity has come down very mm -hmm. strongly due to the present drugs. Yep. So, yeah. and if you allow for plasticity to come back, I think you can do a lot. Okay. I would like to thank the audience for uh, being with us and for posing these questions. And as I said, we have had many more. Uh, before we say goodbye for today, I would just like to ask you, what do you think? You have been in, at numerous congresses, of course, in your life. What do you think about this format for a scientific exchange? Do you like it? It's quite new for both of us. As, especially if I speak for myself, this is my, the only opportunity I, I have to take part in scientific meetings unless they are in Gothenburg because I don't travel anymore. So this is, the, it is what is left for me and I am so pleased about this. But this is speaking for myself. It, uh, thinking in general terms, I think it, this it has this way of communication has a tremendous uh, future. Yeah, certainly, I agree. absolutely. Okay, then I just would like to thank again Avi Carlson for sharing his ideas about this amazing drug and the concept of dopamine stabilization, and to the organizers of this event and to the audience. Um, thank you very much for having been with us. Bye bye. <laughs>